Alfonso, as it states on screen, is the Chief Relationship Officer for NASBA. NASBA is the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, so we work with state boards of accountancy all throughout the country to increase and enhance their effectiveness. Now, one subset of NASBA is the Center for Public Trust, and within the Center for Public Trust, Alfonso works as the Vice President of Development. In that role, he helps lead the development, the programming, and strategic planning for the NASBA Center for the Public Trust. So now I will turn it over to Alfonso, and thank you very much for working with us today. Thank you, Linda. Um, I recognize a couple things. One is that you guys have had a great day where you've heard from a lot of professionals who are professors, and they've given you a lot of great information throughout the day on different topics. And I want to first let you know that I am not a professor, I'm a facilitator. And as a facilitator, I know that my role is not to do a lot of lecturing, but to engage you in conversation. And, and I really plan to speak about 30% of the time and give you guys the opportunity to share for about 70% of the time. Now, the good thing about that is you don't have to listen to me uh, try and lecture to you. The challenge that I recognize is that I am the only thing between you and the end of the day. So what I say to you is the more energy and the more interaction we have, the faster we'll be able to cover the subject matter that I, I want us to discuss and share. So I think we'll have an opportunity to talk about some really good things in this portion, and, and I think you'll appreciate some of the things we share, but the magic of it is going to be the level of input that you guys give, because um, I'm talking about, we'll be talking about creating public confidence. The reality is there's no one way to do it. My intent is to share some things with you that can be done both internally and externally, give you some tips, and then to really hear your reaction, to hear your input, to hear your advice to all of us on some some of these things that I share, as well as some other ways that some of these things could be done. So is that fair? I will facilitate. You guys will participate? Yes. Sir. All right, we'll move forward. So let's practice. Here it is. First question. Creating public confidence. Where does it start? Where does it begin? you are going to create public confidence within your organization, where do you begin? With you. With Say again? Yeah, with yourself. With yourself. Great. I heard that <laughs> in two places. Anyone opposed to that? I heard something else over here, too. I, didn't. I said at the top. At the top. So with, within yourself, let's assume everybody in here is a leader. So we lead some part of the organization that we're hoping to create public confidence in. First place we've got to start is within ourselves to build that confidence. So if we look at it in terms of a three three pronged approach here, leadership within the organization is number one. If I had a prize, Milton, you would get it because you got the first answer to the question correct. <laughs> I don't have the prize with me unless you like. <laughs> might not be ethical, but I, I have to think about whether I can accept it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second one is, if you're a leader and you turn around and nobody's behind you, or no one is with you, then you're really not a leader. You're just somebody out there, maybe just saying words or maybe just doing things, but you have to have a workforce or someone to follow you, really, for you to be a leader. So the second uh, approach or the second phase of this approach is the workforce and the workforce getting buy-in and participating along with the leader, going in lockstep with that. Once that happens, then you have an opportunity to execute. Execute from a performance standpoint, which is one of the first things that promotes public confidence. Execute from a, from a uh, standpoint of helping people understand who you are, what you're about, and what you're trying to accomplish as an organization, which leads to uh, public confidence. So uh, if some of you may remember in Covey's Seven Habits, he created or he introduced to us um, two circles. The first one is a circle of concern, and then the second one is a circle of influence. And Covey's approach to that was, here's some things that can help you understand how you can be more productive. His argument was that 
if we all was that we all have a circle of concern. These are things that we are concerned about. We're not, we understand. We we wish that we could do something about, or we put make efforts to do something about these things. And that circle is is the bigger circle of the two. But inside that circle of concern, of all the things that we are aware of or concerned about, there are some things that we can influence. And so they're the smaller circle. His argument is if we focus, instead of the large circle of all the things that we're concerned on or concerned with, we focus on the things that we actually can influence, the things we actually can impact, then what we in turn will do is be more productive. And then once we're more productive, that circle of influence begins to expand. What I want to contend is that this same thing can work for an organization as we try and create public confidence. If we first focus on the internal, what we can influence within our organization, if we're leaders and we have a responsibility for a certain part of that organization, if we focus on leading and building and strengthening and being more productive in those areas, and increasing our communication in those areas that we impact, what begins to happen is we will create an energy and a synergy so that our influence expands. So if we're working in an organization and we have X number of direct reports that are a part of our organization and we pour into them, we establish and build and strengthen relationships with them, then our influence with them grows. They also have, though, the same circle of influence. And what begins to happen is we impact them in a positive way. Their influence begins to grow because of what we're pouring into them. <coughs> they begin to expand out. And before you know it, because of the nature of the networking that we do just in our everyday lives, my influence on the next person, because I'm a leader, impacts that person, they influence people because they too lead in whatever environment they're in, or at least they influence in whatever environment they're in. And now what you have is you have a broad network that is expanding so that that whole circle of concern is being covered somewhere within that network. And so it has an exponential potential to spread out. But what in the world does that have to do with an organization? If, if we as leaders of our organizations can pour into and positively influence our people, what we do is we build trust and we create advocates for our organization. And then if we have employees that are advocates, they go out into the community, they go out into their churches, into their homes, into the stores, into uh, every place that they go as an advocate for our company, and what we're doing is building confidence and trust in our company because they talk about those things. Um, just to give an editorial real quick, NASBA has been named uh, for the fourth year in a row one of the best places to work in our, in our city, in Nashville. And that's because the employees advocate on our behalf more than anything else. But it starts with the leadership, and the leadership influencing each of those employees and then that going out and spreading out. So we in turn are building public confidence because our people are going out into the city and spreading the word. And it's gotten to a point to where it's caught on so we've been able to participate in surveys where the employees, who are these advocates, vote positive or negative. They have an opportunity to say good or bad things about us and they've said good things enough to where we're now recognized in the city as one of the best places to work because we've created uh, advocates and expanded our influence and impacted these people in positive ways. So leadership is the first step or the first prong and then uh, getting buy-in from the workforce is second. Let me hear your reactions to that. Any job openings? <laughs> Ask the gentleman there, either one of those guys in front of you. Well, it's not my job. <laughs>
like you were trusted and respected, that you talk about that with your friends too. So, Absolutely. Yeah. It can work both ways. In fact, employees can be mirrors. So they can mirror what they hear and what they see and what they get from the leaders within the organization and go out and spread that out to your clients. Uh, I can guarantee you, if you've got someone that, that's in a client-facing role in their organization, in your organization, if they are unhappy, it's, it's noticeable when those clients uh, interact with them. Same thing, though, again, if it's a positive piece, then it also helps to build that confidence in your organization because these are your advocates, good or bad, they're your advocates, so it, it pays to invest in them. Other thoughts on this? I think Alfonso, on the same thought there on employees. I mean, we can tell in Albuquerque exactly which accounting firms are having issues with keeping their people, what they're doing at that firm. And we know that we've heard about company A or CPA firm A. Just like you said, you were talking about those employers are out there saying bad things about who they work for. And we know in our, in our practice development efforts in that community, we are looking at those firms and we're we just offered our employees, again, bonuses for attracting people to our firm at any level. It could be a staff, senior, uh, supervisor. You can get from the other firm a senior manager, a tax manager, an audit manager. We're going to pay you X amount. And we already know what firms are having those kind of issues because their employees are out there bad mouth the firm they work for. So it's just really critical to keep those people happy <coughs> doing those kind of things you're talking about. Absolutely. Critical. Absolutely. So we can, we can, it starts within. If we're wanting to create public confidence, we have to first look at ourselves and the people that we influence within our organizations and see what we're doing to improve uh, those relationships and improve ourselves from there. Great input, thank you. Uh, the inside job. I've got seven points up here that are six here that I think are some relevant things that we all can do to help positively impact the inside of our organization and then that be cascaded externally. First one is build trust through frequent, open, and honest communication. If we think in terms of our peers and our employees that we work with, if they can depend on us to communicate frequently, openly, and honestly with them, then in turn, the benefit for us is that they start, the, the, uh, start down the road of becoming those advocates. Second point is rally support around some kind of thematic goal or, or some type of inspiring business objective. If we position ourselves as an organization to where everyone is singularly focused on some thematic goal that we have or this inspiring objective that we have, that we can really turn around our business, we can develop confidence and develop energy within the organization. Um, there are two examples where I can see this, potentially, this the organization had the potential to do this. How many of you guys remember um, Tylenol back when Tylenol had the contamination issues? <clears throat> Most everybody in the room, okay? How many of you remember when uh, Jack in the Box had the contamination issues. <laughs> fewer people, some, but fewer. They both had nearly the same situation, but they handled them differently. In Tylenol's case, if you think about it, uh, Tylenol did a few things when uh, the contamination was found. Somebody just kind of share with the group to help us remember what Tylenol, some of the things you remember Tylenol did. did. What they did? Yes, what they did. They ordered all the, all the uh, goods off the shelf. They immediately ordered all the goods off the shelf. They stepped up and said, you know what? We messed up. They were honest in their communication, and they put it out there, hey, we messed up. Good. What, what's something else they did? Sealed the caps. They sealed the caps. They recognized, oh, we have a deficiency here. we got to seal these caps. Now, there was a lot, I'm sure, that happened between pulling them off the shelf and sealing the caps. They probably said, you know what, we've got to come up with something to get this problem resolved. Everybody in this organization needs to be focused on how we can <coughs> resolve this problem. And the big, the big thing for them was the sealing of the caps. That was a big solution that they came out with. 
but we've got to figure out how we can do that and then bring our organization back to the positive reputation that we had. Guess what? That's a thematic goal. We want to solve this problem and land back to where we're the number one over-the-counter pain medication in the world. Everybody there was focused at that time on that thematic goal. And guess what? Now, every, just about everybody in this room could raise their hand if they remember <coughs> that scenario, remember that situation, remember what happened uh, because of what they've done. And now they're back on top. And it didn't take them really that long because they focused on rallying that support around their goal of the, and objective, but it came really after they were very open and honest. And I can remember it was something in the newspaper nearly every day, not just from the media, but from them mm -hmm. saying, here's what's going on, here's what we're doing. They kept that communication line open, both internally and externally. Now we flipped the coin, tight, uh, uh, Jack in the Box. Does anybody remember? kind of what was going on with Jack in the Box? They had tainted meat. What did they do? Sort of denied it, and then there was some delay, and then before they ever came out with a statement about it. They denied it at first, so no honest open communication. They de Well, at first they delayed it. They tried to ignore it, then they denied it, and then when they did come out and communicate, instead of saying, hey, we're taking everything off the shelf. We're to blame here. They said somebody who, <clears throat> one of our suppliers, gave us this contaminated meat. It's their fault. We're going to fix it, but it's their fault. They never took blame for it. They tried to push the blame out. And what ended up happening is nearly 95% of their stores closed. They almost went completely out of business. Where? On the other hand, Tylenol came back stronger than ever because they rallied around this thematic goal, they communicated, they kept it on the forefront, whereas Jack in the Box, now even, they've, they've slowly come back. They were number three or four in the fast food hamburger business. They've slowly come back now, but how many seen a, who's seen a Jack in the Box commercial recently? Yeah, I see if you watch sports, you probably see them quite a bit. Have you noticed they never talk about their hamburgers? <laughs> <laughs> that little upside down snowman or whatever. <laughs> Snow caller, so whatever he is, he's always talking about, you know, now we got burritos or this chicken sandwich. Or, you know, they, they still sell burgers. They don't even talk about it. They don't even bring it up. And so they, they probably will never get back to the level where they were from a market share standpoint, but it's all because they did not honestly and openly address it, nor did they rally behind this thing to say, hey, let's fix this thing. They just tried to ignore it, tried to limp along, tried to push the blame out. So I think that creating public confidence, a great example is to do what Tylenol did. And it's even better if we can do it before a crisis happens versus after a crisis. Um, the point number three there is, if we develop this theme and this goal, we've got to figure out a way to execute it. So we've got to put a plan in place so that we can execute this thematic goal uh, or this, this theme. Uh, Jim Collins talks about in Good to Great, uh, he talks about getting the right people on the right bus and in the right seats. And you know, my point is, if we have this goal and this plan, we've got to make sure that we have the right people in alignment to be able to execute that goal and plan. And that's a big challenge for us sometimes. So we can have good people, but good people put in the wrong place limits our capabilities, and it can cause other problems that could damage the confidence, especially the confidence in leaders. If we've got an issue with a person or issues with people that we don't address, then we damage the confidence of the other people in the peer group. And if, if as a leader, if people who I have responsibility for, don't have confidence in me that I'll deal with an issue, then eventually that will come out. Eventually, them being mirrors will spread to other coworkers and then it could potentially spread outside the organization. Um, so get the right people aligned in the right place and then 
position things so that you can have some early successes. Um, I'm a football fan and, and I live in Nashville, Tennessee, so you know our football team is the only undefeated team in the NFL right now because we've had these early successes. But Dallas will be there. And uh, you know Dallas keeps losing these games, and so so I know that if we face Dallas in the Super Bowl, uh, we'll do well. But one thing, is, one thing, the reason I bring it up, I know I'm in Texas, so everybody's in Texas, but I, I, one, the reason I bring that up is because uh, in the NFL, as well as in other markets, uh, oftentimes the team that's the front runner, or in other places other than just the NFL, teams that are the front runner oftentimes end up building momentum that carries them through throughout the rest of the season. The Tennessee Titans have been to the Super Bowl one time, and that one time that they went, they were 9-1 and one in their first 10 games. They built so much momentum that they, would just, they just knew how to win. And it's because they had early success, and that early success cascaded through the rest of the season. I don't know how they'll finish up this year, uh, but I'm excited about it. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm uh, helping to celebrate. I'm involved when I, I go to football games sometimes. My energy level is higher. And that very same thing can happen throughout our organization. Uh, there's a tremendous buzz going on around here because of what UT did last Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say where or who it is or anything like that, but there is a Missouri Tiger in here. And, you know, I'm sure he's hoping that those early successes that Texas has had um, won't carry over. Um, I'm not going to say it's a guy in the black jacket over there in the corner. But, but the early successes yes. and celebrating those accomplishments really build the enthusiasm. And again, if we're talking about advocates. They help people go outside the organization and say positive things about the organization. Once you've achieved these things and you've gotten to a level to where you've accomplished that thematic goal, uh, then you got to go find another one because you brought people up to a very high energy level and then once that happened, then you got to find something else to do. Um, a good example in the corporate arena of this is when companies do mergers and acquisitions. If you look at the history of, of companies that buy other companies and acquire other companies, the ones that have the merger linger on end up suffering and losing some market share for a period of time versus the ones who have a very strong plan and they go in and they have this goal and everybody's focused on making this merger happen and getting it behind them so that they uh, don't lose or have as great a risk. The longer you let it linger, the uh, more you lose. So this is an example of how that can work, but the key thing is you've gotten this energy started. Once it's done, you gotta go find another one another thematic goal to get your energy around. So those are the inside job examples. Let me hear from you. Have you seen this work at any companies or something like it? Creating public confidence and success. Yes? The University of Texas. On the football field or <laughs> Elaborate on that for us. Created a good positive public image. People think how they've been living the state there and done a very good job of it. So the university has created a good positive public image. People think highly of it. And so now people, that, that's probably a good recruiting mechanism, I would imagine. You should write that down, Erton. <laughs> 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 Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Other examples of where this may have happened before, or you've seen it. Yeah. Yes. Alfonso, you, you mentioned the, the uh, drug manufacturer. And what always I remember about that is not necessarily what they did, although I do recall that, but also it wasn't their manufacturing process that caused this problem. Mm -hmm. They just immediately stepped up and took, took care of the problem. 
Right. Whereas, as you point out, Jack in the Box tried to defer, defer the blame, et cetera, That's right. et cetera. That's right. And, and, and for a long time, I couldn't, I had to go back and do some research to re even remember exactly what it was, what kind of poison was in there and all that, but I couldn't remember that, but I could remember how they responded. And I know that I feel very confident when I go to Walgreens or somewhere and buy uh, some Tylenol, I feel like it's probably the safest of any of the other products there on the shelf. But, but that matter changed the whole industry. Exactly. It did, because, absolutely. Uh, and it was great. Uh, it was a tampering where mm -hmm. people actually took it off the shelves, put stuff in the pills, put them back on, and people mm -hmm. bought them. So right. it wasn't a manufacturing process as much as it was people tampering. And it, it changed the whole uh, realm of the industry and how you seal things. And then they went too far because people couldn't get it open. open. <laughs> <laughs> you had arthritis, you'd have to get your kids and they could open it. Uh, and so they changed it. But it, it's interesting how that really did become a big deal. Yeah. Right. I was going to say the same thing. I mean, it not only did it increase the public confidence or restore the public confidence in Tylenol, but Everywhere. they really did a, a service to the industry by doing that Right. as a result of, of that happening. because. It wouldn't just be Tylenol that we, as consumers, would be worried about. We would be worried about anything yeah, yeah. that we're, we're exposed to. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And the so, converse is in the Jack in the Box, people were worried about hamburgers at McDonald's and Burger King. Yes. Oh, yeah, and right. no one would eat them anywhere at fast food restaurants. That's right. That's right. Great, great examples. Um, and especially when I, you, you're talking about how it impacted the whole industry. Um, Another example of a company where this has worked is Walgreens. So think back about Walgreens and uh, how 25, 30 years ago, what, what was Walgreens, what did it look like on the inside and how were they set up? What, what kind of, what were some of the things they were focused on? Maybe we need to go back 30 years, yes. Anybody remember Walgreens 30 years ago? Oh yeah. You want to share with us, Harold? What? Oh, it, it, it doesn't look anything like the store does now. No. no it completely changed their, their whole philosophy of marketing mm -hmm. and, and public presentation of the premises. Public presentation, marketing, it, they had restaurants inside. Didn't oh, they? yeah. Uh, counters, so you could go in and eat lunch. But that was Walgreens, and, and Walgreens and, and Woolworth, were, they were also set up the same way. And the leaders within Walgreens said, you know what, we, I want to change, we need to make a change. And they centered, created this theme around becoming convenient pharmacies. Before that, you had mom and pop pharmacies, you had pharmacies at uh, hospitals. But they said, you know what, we can create a convenience around pharmacies and created really a whole industry and almost crippled that industry. They impacted that whole industry around this one thing. What they wanted to do is to make pharmacies available to anybody in just about anywhere. And they, they, they took some of the uh, concept that McDonald's had to where uh, McDonald's wanted to be on, on street corners in prime locations. And that's what they did. And, and for about a three year period, Walgreens was opening what averaged out to be a store a day. And what they ended up doing was crippling the uh, pharmacy schools, because there's a limited number of pharmacy schools in the United States. But they were growing and having so much success so fast because they got around this thing and they, they got a lot of energy around it and it just expanded and grew that uh, pharmacy schools weren't putting out enough pharmacists. Hospitals were losing pharmacists because they could go work at Walgreens, have a more consistent schedule, and be able to uh, make more money. Then. Kroger and other grocery stores and uh, other Eckers and other chains got involved in this whole phenomenon that, that Walgreens had created. But it started with them getting around this thematic goal, putting plans in place and saying, you know what, we're going to create this whole new industry. And then the education system had to catch up. And now today, still pharmacists are pretty, in, uh, pretty high demand career field. And Walgreens started that. But they have, but they have, in my opinion, they've hurt the pharmacy industry terribly because before pharmacists were were, uh, were professionals, today they're semi-professionals. I mean, in other words, they they work for half of what they 
used to earn. They, they don't have the opportunity to have their own uh, uh, pharmacies. Uh, it's very difficult for a, for a pharmacy, a small drugstore with a pharmacy to stay in business today. Uh, and and, and if you, I mean, you, you have, there, there are serious problems in the pharmacy industry today compared to what it was before. I'm sure if you speak to any pharmacist that has uh, been around for 10 or 15 years or more, they will tell you that their, their, their profession has uh, gone downhill substantially because of places like, uh, like uh, Walgreens and, and other entities of that size and that type. Because the market had to react to all of a sudden this, this now problem that we have with the supply of pharmacists. I only state that because of the fact that you said there's a shortage. That's one of the reasons there's a shortage because less people want to go to school now to become a pharmacist than years ago. Mm -hmm. And there are more positions because they've got all these Walgreens and Dennis Reeds and everything all over the place. Good point. Uh, but I will say, I'm very confident when I go into Walgreens and buy some Tylenol that it's, that it's going to be <laughs> safe. And, and, and I feel like I'm confident that, that Walgreens is going to have what I'm looking for in stock because they got around this thing. And, 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 and as Milton's pointed out, it did create some other issues. Uh, that are outside of the scope of what they were looking to do. The problem yeah. is that you really wanted Bayer, you got Tylenol because you couldn't speak to a very qualified pharmacist. Part of that is, is what I perceive as just the marketplace at work. I mean, they expanded the product offerings along with whatever else they did and how they did it. But they essentially made the decision to get the hell out of the food business. They did. And to concentrate on what they thought they knew best. Mm -hmm. And that was pharmaceutical products. That's right. Good point. Good point. Uh, any other examples where you've seen this thematic goal and, and, and a company successfully going after it? You know, GE, when Jack Welch took over, went through a similar process and uh, got focused on some other things and, and achieved a certain number of success too. And there are countless others that we could name. Uh, for time's sake, I will move on though. So we talked about internal, and I think we all agree that you start within and work out, and it, it's an exponential effect there. So outside the job, what are some things that we can do to, the outside job, excuse me, what are some things that we can do to create public confidence? One is make a senior level person within the organization responsible for stakeholder relationships. The higher you go up in, a, in any organization, the more important an issue is, and the higher level of priority is for that organization. So if we've got someone that's, that's a key player within the organization responsible, excuse me, for managing those relationships and building the relationships outside, then that will help build the public confidence because it gets priority within the organization. Another thing is develop small, internal, cross-functional teams, cross-level teams, to think about initiatives that will help promote the organization and the good things that the organization is doing. I, I gotta tell you, I learned a lot just from going through the experience of us organizing this event today about two organizations that I really had not heard about uh, before. Uh, the Society of Corporate Compliance and Executives and, and Ron's organization from the presentation you guys just left. I've really not heard much of those organizations before, but now I have, and it's because we've interacted with them, but I gotta believe that, and they probably hadn't heard a lot about our organization, but I have to believe that because of if we put some teams, some cross-functional teams in place, within those organizations to hey, say, get the word out, hear the great things that we're doing, then there would have been a greater chance of us hearing and understanding what's going on and knowing about the good things that these other organizations are doing. So uh, don't just let it ride within the responsibility of that one person, but, but have that person put together a team of folks to help execute. Um, get input from external stakeholders frequently. Talk to customers, ask for feedback. Sometimes we're afraid to ask for feedback because we're afraid of what we might get, but that's a great way to surface opportunities. Uh, it can be done in 
Yeah. What we do at our CPA firm, a lot of firms probably do this, they go out and ask for client feedback on how we, how are we doing. <coughs> it's amazing some of the things you get back and we've made adjustments. They might say something that we'll just go ahead and change the partner on the engagement to someone else based on that feedback. We also have, a little bit off, we also have employees evaluate the partners. That, that, that's a little off, off course here, but that is really important information to get back to see how you're doing as a leader in that firm. And, but, but the one with the clients, that's amazing, the feedback you get. Because in a CPA firm, the, the, the best source of new business here is, is your existing clients. Right. It's not doing seminars and all these kind of things. It's the existing client will tell you that guy is a great CPA, you gotta go see him. Especially now with the economy and things going on, a lot of clients are out there, or, or industries or companies are out there wanting to make change. And I think this kind of feedback, we know if we're doing a good job. If we're not doing a good job with that particular client, we might be assigned to some other partner or some other management team. But it's critical information we get every year. Right. Very important. Right. I would contend that if if you have a, a client and you go to that client and, and say, hey, give me some feedback, how are we doing? And they give you something that's a correctable issue and you go back and correct it, then now that client has bought into who you are and is more likely to refer you to someone else because they know if there's a problem, first of all, you're not afraid to come and ask them, hey, what's going on? Can you give us some feedback? And then you'll follow up on it and you'll correct that problem. So their confidence in you has just increased and they're more likely to refer you and now you've also worked through this issue and you have a relationship. So thank you for that. But there are many ways to do that. One-on-one -on -one conversations, surveys, uh, focus groups as well. Uh, conduct a vulnerability analysis. If you think in terms of Jack in the Box, you know, Jack in the Box had said, where are our risks? Where are we vulnerable? We're, we're buying meat from 15 different meat processing companies across the country. We need to have a plan in place in case something goes wrong at one of those meat packing companies and we don't know it. How do we address this? I think had they done a vulnerability analysis and put some kind of crisis management plan in place, they wouldn't have just said nothing for a long time and then they wouldn't have you know, tried to deny it and then point the blame somewhere else. They probably would have said, you know what, we got to step up to this, we need to deal with it, and here's how we're going to do it. I bet Tylenol had a plan in place, and that's why they were able to respond as quickly as they were. The, the important thing is that if we, if we do this analysis, we can see where our risks are, and then once we see where our risks are, we may even be able to prevent them. It's all, it's all about being proactive. And if we're not able to prevent them, but we have a plan on how to deal with it, which is the next point there, uh, we have a plan on how to deal with it, then again, the public can say, you know what, they're not perfect and I know they're not, but they will immediately <coughs> deal with and address their issues in a proactive way. Uh, number six is be strategic and proactive about sharing relevant information with all stakeholders. There are certain things and certain times where it's good to share information with your stakeholders strategically so they can put it out there for you as well. If, if you've got some initiatives going on that are some improvement kinds of things within your organization and you let the board of directors know so they can go out and be advocates for you or you let a certain pool of clients know because they work in a, in a particular industry, then now what you've done is you have created some other marketing or some other PR people for you outside of your organization. You created those advocates. Uh, and, you, and it's all a part of being transparent. Stakeholders enjoy the fact that we're transparent and we're willing to share things, good or bad, with them. In the same line, if you're a stakeholder, demand transparency from your vendors. Because if you are getting information and your vendors are being transparent with you, then you can identify vulnerabilities that you have and be able to plan for those and be able to address those. Okay, so those are seven external things that we can do. So, what does your experience say about some things you can do from the outside? I'd like to chart up any ideas that aren't on those seven or any feedback that you have with those seven, but 
What are some things that we can do externally to promote and build public confidence that I haven't mentioned? Seven again? Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, I can show you three or four at a time. <laughs> They're the last three, and then the first three. Our first three, yeah, four. got into a conversation in the earlier group about uh, the United Way and March of Dimes, mm -hmm. two organizations that raise a lot of money. So the public has to have confidence in those organizations. United Way had some slips several years ago in the late 80s uh, and took some major hits from a public confidence standpoint. March of Dimes just kept on ticking along the way. What are some of the things that you maybe see them or organizations like them doing to create public confidence? Anybody ever seen a, a yeah, go ahead. Uh, just, uh, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but I think whether it's United Way or it's NASBA or General Motors or whomever, I think you got to get out in the community, some of the, the communities that you serve, the communities that you want to instill that public confidence in. You've got to get out there. You can't do it from your office. You can't do it from the boardroom. You can't do it through policy making. You've got to put some legs and energy behind what it is you want to influence. And it can be as simple as joining in the local breast cancer fight. It can be as simple as a march of dimes. It can be a, a, a it can be any number of things. Mm -hmm. But you've got to make a presence. You've got to show the community that you care about what's going on. Sure, good point. So you've got to be visible. Yeah. Seems like the United Way, if I remember, didn't they go and partner with a lot of large Fortune 100 companies, like GE in particular? I know there was a strong partnership there to help bring them back in the marketplace. In terms of their purpose. So maybe it was a strong partner that helped them, uh, or that believed in them to help them get more exposure. Okay. Good. So partner with trusted, strong other organizations. Good point. Others? interesting. I'm in the process now of purchasing a chain of Dunkin' Donuts, and I met with the son of the seller, and he said to me that uh, one of the things you have to do, Milton, you have to get out there and get active with all the communities, whether it's Heart Fund, Cancer Fund, everyone out there in, in the community, wherever, wherever the location of the Dunkin' Donuts is, but they have to see that you're interested in them. Terribly important. So be, being a good corporate citizen for, uh, within the community. Good one. How many of you, how many of you trust institutions, or companies, or organizations? How many of you really trust them? Depends on the organization. Yeah. A few? A few? Yeah. Depends on the organization. How many of you trust people? Yeah. Not all people. Depends on the people. Right? Well, when you think about it, and part of the, the concept, I think, with, with both of these is that people buy into who we are. They trust who we are. And so if, if NASBA has a good reputation, it's not really because of that institution, it's because of the leaders and the people that are involved in NASPA. So the same thing with the university here. I know the gentleman back there mentioned that the university has built a great reputation. I would imagine that once you 
delve down into it is because of the faculty and the staff of the organization. So investing in the people, getting the right people is so critical in building public confidence because it leads into culture. So I've got a few uh, statements here that I'd just like for us all to react in the last few minutes that we have. The first one is your organization's culture drives its ability to create confidence. Anybody believe in that? Disagree with it? What's your reaction to it? Sure, sure. I've mentioned Nashville is, is known as one of the good places to work in Nashville. Now, what, that's for four years in a row now. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? What, has, what started all that? It started with the people at the top, and it's filtered down little by little by little. There it is. So that's how you build those kind of confidence of the public in not only your internal public, but the external public. They know it now because that's one of the celebrated items in the Nashville community. Right. Good. Great point. Great point. Ken? You know, I think it goes, and I think almost a lot of weeks it comes up. I mean, when, when <laughs> staff knows that the organization's culture is to do the right thing, it gives them the confidence to commit to do something to someone, to a customer, to a stakeholder, to a candidate, whatever that stakeholder is. Uh, they know the company's going to stand behind them. They know that we are going to do the right thing. Uh, they don't feel like they're going out on a limb uh, by saying that we're going to do the right thing. and. Uh, uh, and we don't want them to hesitate. You know, if there's a situation where the right thing is evident, we want them to quickly get to that. To make it known. That's a great point. Great point. Here's another piece of it. Culture drives reputation. And if our reputation is positive, then it drives confidence. If it's not, then it drives no confidence. But our reputation really is built upon our culture. So thanks, great points. Here's another one. Employees are the mirrors to the outside. And we touched on that a little bit earlier. But if an employee feels good about the organization and what's going on, they can't help. It's human nature. They can't help but to share that out uh, with the one, rest of the world. One thing that comes to mind, too, and it's probably the same with NASBA, I'm sure the employee retention is very high. In our proposals at our firm, we always talk about the fact that we have very good employee retention. We'll have the same person back on the job next year. Those kind of things are critical in getting that, keeping that client and getting more business. But I bet at NASPA, it's probably pretty good retention. 95%. I think we were at 80, 85, I believe, at Moss Adams in Albuquerque. Great. So employees are mirrors. They can reflect the good and the bad. Yeah. So to build public confidence, we want to reflect the good. Being faultless is key. Faultless. Is that attainable? Well, the, the provocative part there is that um, Jack in the Box tried to pretend they were faultless, right, and that didn't pay off. So um, if you were to replace faultless with responsible or accountable, okay. then I could agree more easily with that statement. Okay. Or like Southwest Airlines, on time. Mm -hmm. They advertise mm -hmm. their on time. So you're saying, the more times we can be right without being late, the confidence goes up, the public will use our airline kind of thing, being faultless. Good, good. So in one respect, you know, a company tried to claim faultless and it was, it was inaccurate, but in another respect, uh, uh, an airline really strives to be who they say they are. Uh, again, we think about, about Tylenol, they came out and said, oh, we messed up. We made a mistake. We're pulling everything off, and here's what we're going to do about it in the future. And they kept us informed. Now, had Bayer or someone else beat them to that, 
then we all would have found a world of fault with them. But because they stepped out there, it's like we gave them a pass. We forgave them and, and worked with them. And the evidence is that their market share went back up almost immediately after they put the product back on the shelf. So no, they weren't faultless, but they positioned themselves to say, we, we, we're not perfect, but we're working towards perfection and here's what we're trying to do with it. Next one is never be perceived as being on the attack. Trying to create public confidence. How does that fit? Attacking what? <laughs> <laughs> Anything. Is that back to the jack in the box scenario where they attack their vendor or their supplier to make themselves look better? Absolutely. That was my example. Um, jack in the box did the wrong thing. They attacked. Yes. They're vendors. And so now I'm being aggressive in my behavior. I'm attacking these other folks. You know what I'm really doing? Is I'm decreasing the confidence that people have in me. Mm -hmm. uh, in the previous session, they brought up politics and approval ratings and, and different things from some of the surveys from the debate last night. When people were on the attack, I didn't get to see it, but apparently when either candidate was on the attack, the little ticker, tick, the little uh, green and yellow lines that they've been doing on CNN went down. But when they weren't on the attack, they went up. And so when we are, when we position ourselves on the attack, then uh, oftentimes the public loses confidence in us. As the example, but uh, my example was Jack in the Box and how they, they did that. Word choices are critical to building confidence. That seems pretty obvious, I guess, but why would it, why would I put that up there since it's so obvious? Why are they critical? Why, what, what about our environment makes them so critical? You can't take them back. Can't take them back. And sometimes it's just about context. Um, I mentioned that I'm a sports fan, and oftentimes Sports Center and the other, these other sports outlets show these athletes responding or talking. And if I didn't think about it, I would think that they were just up giving speeches. But in reality, we live in a soundbite world. And so we have to be intentional about the choices that we use because those words could be taken out of context because what people are hearing are sound bites versus the, the question even that you were asked, that you're responding to. So word choices are very important when trying to create public confidence and we really have to be sensitive to what we're saying and intentional about how we respond to it. <clears throat> we have about six minutes left and I have this last slide to share and this is, is not where it begins, it's really where it ends. But oftentimes people will talk about these things as the beginning, or they end up being the launching pad for concern within organizations. So really, if you think about Covey's uh, Seven Habits again, he talks about beginning with the end in mind. So from an end standpoint, when we are doing well and building public confidence, we can get positive media reports. We get good customer referrals. We can have failing competition because we're dominating and we're growing our market share to such a great extent. And we can win when it comes to the rankings. And that cascades across business. You know, Fortune does a 500 company listing every year. The, the most admired companies, we see that every year. Uh, universities, we see top uh, business schools or top universities every year and all kinds of other rankings that can come out of public confidence. So I would just say to you that when we think in terms of how we build public confidence, it first starts with me as an individual leader, the other people that work with me that I impact, and if we're doing a good job internally, it can spread out externally. We create advocates in the marketplace for us, and then ultimately, we can see positive results on these things. And they're really the end and not the beginning. That's it for me.
Unless you have any other questions or input, I thank you for your time.